Привет, это Навальный, и это расследование... This is Alexei Navalny you're hearing in a video he posted to YouTube on January 19th, 2021, just after his arrest. Putin, мелкий сотрудник КГБ. The target of this video is Vladimir Putin. It's a two-hour-long investigation, packaged like an entertainment TV show. Вау, разведчик! It's an inside look into a billion-dollar palace. So grand that Navalny says it's like Versailles, but on the banks of the Black Sea in Russia. Navalny's team say they were able to fly over the enormous estate with a drone. They say they obtained a plan and an inventory of the palace. Based on it, they recreated 3D images of huge rooms with marble floors, golden decorations, crystal chandeliers, a theater, an ice rink, and even a casino. One detail struck many people – a 700-euro Italian toilet brush. It's the most secret and guarded facility in Russia. This is not a country house, not a dacha. It's an entire city, even a kingdom. It has unbreachable fences, its own checkpoint. It's a separate state within Russia with a single and irreplaceable Tsar – Putin. Navalny's team say they have proof the palace was a gift to Putin from corrupt elites. They show pictures, documents and evidence of financial ties linking Putin and several oligarchs. The video's title is Putin's Palace – History of the World's Largest Bribe. But bribery and corruption – these aren't just the themes of a single report. They're at the core of Navalny's fight against the Kremlin. Welcome to The Poisoning, an AFP podcast. Episode 4, The Palace. My name is Andrea Palasciano. And I'm Jonathan Braun. We're journalists working for the global news agency, AFP, in Moscow. The timing of the video's release is crucial. It was published just two days after Navalny returned to Russia and was detained. His arrest, along with the expose, sparked massive protests across the country. The woman you hear talking is a young protester. AFP filmed her being detained by two officers. In the video, she's smiling. And in her hands, a toilet brush. It's a reference to Navalny's video. The luxurious toilet brush had briefly become a symbol of frustration with corruption among Russia's elites. Independent polling tells us that for Russians, corruption is a key concern. And Navalny's palace video went viral, racking up more than 100 million views in just 10 days. It got to the point where Putin did something unprecedented. He addressed the allegations himself. Nothing. Nothing described there as being my property is mine or ever has been. Not mine, not to my relatives, never. I didn't watch the film just because I didn't have time for that kind of information. But I went through the experts my assistants brought me. But Navalny isn't just calling out the single bribe, as he calls it. He's drawing attention to a problem he feels is systemic, corruption. Mostly, I would say Russia's problem is corruption at um, high levels of power. This is Maria Liebman, a political analyst at George Washington University who lives in Moscow. You might remember her from episode three. The disparity of incomes in Russia is indeed huge. And indeed, a uh, vast proportion of national wealth belongs to a very small group of people. But as Liebman sees it, corruption and oligarchs existed in Russia even before Putin. 
Now, the concept of oligarchs emerged in the 90s, and the 1990s, the first decade after the collapse of the Soviet Union, was one of those very rare moments in the history of Russia when the state, the omnipotent uh, and ubiquitous state, grew weak. And not just weak, but weaker, weaker than those who uh, quickly enrich themselves at the expense of the state, because uh, state property was up for grabs. And uh, it is that group of people who enrich themselves tremendously, became billionaires. Just before this, in the final years of the Soviet Union, Putin was an officer in the KGB. The future president was not among those who got rich in the Soviet collapse. Instead, as criminality and poverty were rife, he became determined to restore order and restore pride. Putin's background is that of a civil servant. He was an officer of the Russian intelligence and worked in uh, East Germany. As he observed the collapse of the Soviet Union, to him as a civil servant, uh, it was uh, not a cause of rejoicing. When Putin became president, beginning in 2000, first as acting president and then got elected, one of his first concerns was to reinstate the power of the state. And that meant to strip the oligarchs of their power, to uh, return Russia to its habitual pattern of a ubiquitous and omnipotent state. And he achieved that goal uh, really quickly. By the end of his first term, we're talking about 2004, there was no question who was boss. It was no longer the oligarchs. It was now the state, uh, and state power was centralized. Here's Pyotr Tolstoy, the deputy chairman of the State Duma. He's a member of Putin's United Russia Party. You heard him in previous episodes. For him, Putin's leadership in these early years is important to many Russians. Listen, we didn't have enough food. Today, Russia is an independent and sovereign country capable of setting its own international and economic policy. That will continue. Russians really appreciate that. For them, Putin rebuilt the country after the collapse of communism. For example, in a village where in the 2000s you had two tractors and a single car, today every household owns a car, there are enough tractors. Russia has changed, it's a new country, and it was done in 20 years. I remember very well, and all people who lived in the 90s remember very well. Putin may have set out to clean up, but Navalny's allies say that after two decades, he now presides over a deeply corrupt system. In 2020, Russia ranked towards the bottom of the World Corruption Index, 129th out of 180. So corruption is the essential part of the system. So the system runs Russia through corruption. It would be a very different regime without corruption. So in Russia, the regime needs corruption. That's how it makes decision. That's how it rules its own elites and the rest of the country. Do you have examples? Well, uh, the example is that if you are a governor of a region, if you're a minister, if you're a businessman, you know that part of your wealth is accumulated in illicit ways, illegitimate ways. Which means, at any point of time, if Mr. Putin doesn't like you, he can put you in jail. Sergei Guriev is an old friend of Navalny's who now lives and teaches economics in France. You've heard him in previous episodes. I won't say that Russia is all corrupt, but the overall system is like this. And so the most famous film that Mr. Navalny has produced is his latest film on Mr. Putin's palace, is exactly giving you this example where people around Mr. Putin, knowing that their wealth is due to Mr. Putin's support, built a palace worth more than a billion euros for Mr. Putin. And so that is the bribe to Mr. Putin 
because they know that his support is crucial for them being billionaires. Navalny, in his flashy corruption reports, wants to expose exactly this link between money and politics. And he wants to make the average Russian viewer care. The villas, the yachts, he says these are bought with your money that's been stolen at your expense. Here, for example, is an excerpt from the palace video again. But just in case, a toilet brush and toilet paper stand worth 150,000 rubles will be waiting for him in the toilet. That's the annual pension of the average Russian pensioner in one of Putin's toilets, which Putin himself may never enter. There's a general consensus that life has improved for most Russians since the Soviet collapse and the economic crisis that came with it. But for years now, it's been getting harder and harder to make ends meet. And the pandemic didn't help. In the winter of 2021, for example, I interviewed people at a food bank run by the Orthodox Church in Moscow. Volunteers told me that the number of people coming for basics like milk, sunflower oil, bread, had spiked since the pandemic. One pensioner I spoke to strongly resented the authorities. Of course I'd like the state to help us with food stamps, like in all civilized countries. Russia is not a poor country. We sell oil and gas. There are a lot of oligarchs. Let them share with us ordinary people, because actually material riches were created by us, the old people. And the oligarchs took away our wealth. Guriev believes Putin's popularity among regular Russians, like this pensioner, is directly linked to the success of the economy. The first uh, 10 years of uh, Putin's rule were extremely successful economically. So Russian economy was growing on average at 7% per month. So Russian GDP doubled. And that's never happened in written Russian economic history. That was the best decade in Russian economic history. So when the economy was successful, when incomes were growing really, really fast, Putin has done bad things, but he was still extremely popular because incomes were growing really fast. But now the Russian economy is struggling, and with it, Putin's popularity. Clémentine Fauconnier is a specialist in Russian politics at the University of Haute-Alsace in France. En gros... Vladimir Putin's popularity started dipping in 2009-2010. People were obviously tiring of him, but more importantly, the global financial crisis happened, and that started to have an impact on the Russian economy. And so starting in 2009-2010, Putin's popularity fell progressively from 80% to 60%. But one event interrupted this progressive decline, the annexation of Crimea. And after that, all the indicators clearly went up, and spectacularly so. The annexation of Crimea was extremely popular among a very large segment of the Russian population. I'd say Vladimir Putin had a couple of years when his popularity skyrocketed again. In 2014, Putin annexed the Crimean Peninsula from Ukraine. It was a hit in Russia. His popularity spiked to around 85%. But four years later, that balloon burst with one very unpopular decision. Putin increased the pension age. And then again, I'd say since 2018, since the effort to reform pensions, which more or less failed, so a social issue, Vladimir Putin's popularity is progressively falling again. Guriev believes the slow decline threatens Vladimir Putin. And so today he faces a new legitimacy crisis. And so Putin needs new ideas how to run the country. And so far in the last couple of years, we saw this new idea, which is make sure that there is no opposition politics. So this is what we observe. The system is moving in the wrong direction. And since economy is not doing well, and Russian citizens are less and less excited about Putin, Putin is becoming more and more repressive. Guriev is referring to a historic shift in Russia this year, the unprecedented crackdown on dissenting voices that we talked about in episode one. (music) 
Many opposition figures have fled. Most opposition candidates are barred from running in the September 2021 elections. Here's Vladimir Milov, one of Navalny's closest allies and organizers. The future of opposition is difficult because what the authorities are doing now, I mean, make no mistake, they want to completely shut down all the relatively independent political and civic activity on the ground. So essentially, they want to return to a Soviet system of a permissive style of political activity, like anything which is not permitted is forbidden. If you listen to Putin and the Putin's propaganda, they barely talk about the future. They only talk about the present and the past. They have no image for the future. Where does Russia's embattled opposition go from here? Episode 5 is coming soon, after the election results are announced. Come with us to Lithuania, a new hub for the Russian opposition, to hear how they plan to mobilize from exile and from prison. Thanks for listening to AFP's long-form podcast, The Poisoning. We hope you enjoyed the episode. If you liked it, tell your friends and leave a review wherever you're listening. For more from AFP, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. From Moscow, I'm Andrea Palashano. And I'm Jonathan Brunn. See you soon in episode five.